I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, a story you may have seen coming out of Princeton University, which is symptomatic of the anti-Israel sentiment on elite American campuses, and which is very troubling on so many levels. Here's the story. It centers around a Jewish student named David Esterlitt, a junior at Princeton. David entered Princeton as a freshman in 2014. After completing two years at the school, David took a leave of absence to go to Israel, where he served for three years in the IDF, the Israeli Army. David then returned to Princeton after his three years in the IDF, and during this, his junior year, he became a candidate for president of Princeton's student government campaigning on economic issues, plaguing Princeton students, and not addressing financial injustices of disadvantaged students. David had no reason to assume that his IDF service would be relevant to this election, but it was. A columnist for Princeton's student body paper, The Princetonian, named Braden Flax, wrote that David Esterlich, as, as David was as poor a choice as one could possibly conceive. Why? Because of, as Flex explained, David's front and center background as a member of the Israel Defense Forces. Braden Flax actually wrote in the Princetonian and the student body newspaper of Princeton University actually printed that the IDF is entirely and indiscriminately evil. Flax also wrote that the IDF is known to torment and abuse the entire Palestinian population of human beings. And charged Flax, the IDF is responsible for implementing an Israeli blockade of Gaza, which prevents chocolate bars from entering. And then Flax concluded by saying, anyone who represents a government whose policy is abject terror of a chocolate bar is not fit to hold the office of president for his participation in the Israel Defense Forces, which continuously inflicts injustice that dwarfs proportions of anything most of us have encountered. So understand this. Because a student served in the IDF, he is part of an army that is entirely evil, guilty of inflicting injustice of immense proportion, and is therefore unfit to serve as president of Princeton's student government. Well, this is a story that is just breathtaking. But to learn more about it and to understand what went on behind it, I am so pleased to welcome to the L'Chaim, audit to JBS, David Esterlitt, who is right now at his home in New Jersey, and David, thank you so much for making yourself available to us. Oh, thank you for having me, Mark. First of all, David, did I get it pretty correctly? Was, did I tell the story right? Uh, yes, just one small correction. Please. I only served in the IDF for a year and a half as a volunteer. Okay. After which I took a semester at Hebrew U and uh, worked as a tour guide in the Israeli parliament, the Knesset. I'm sorry, you worked as what? as a tour guide in the Israeli ah, parliament, the ah. Knesset. How was your time in the IDF? Uh, well, it was good, worthwhile, but only in retrospect. It was hard at the uh, time. It's very difficult, yes. And I'll how say it... that you... Go ahead. Yes, you're uh, not aware of how hard you can push yourself until push comes to shove. Yes. And how was it being a tour guide? A tour guide. Now, that was very interesting um, because this tour guide, you weren't just uh, touring around American tour groups, but also foreign dignitaries. Ah. I don't know why they entrusted us to do that, but uh, <laughs> that's what Israel decided to do. So 
So it's pretty interesting to parade the uh, uh, finance minister of Taiwan, of Taiwan from place to place in the wow. country. That's nice. Good for you. How much Thank Hebrew you. did you know before you went to Israel? Well, I went to a Jewish day school uh, where I learned some Hebrew, and my parents are Israeli. Um, my Hebrew was never that strong. It was decent. I did take two courses in Princeton to Israel. Uh, there's a, I did learn quite good Hebrew in the army, but it was very, uh, let's say, colloquial Hebrew. Yes. In fact, as I, when I came back to the States, my dad noticed that I was cursing a lot in English, <laughs> replicating my Hebrew. Yes. But when I worked in the Knesset, in the parliament, my Hebrew improved drastically and it became much more poetic, uh, similar to my English. Very lovely. Um, and do I understand that you conducted the tours in Hebrew? Uh, I would have if I stayed on longer, but I returned to school here. So I only completed my training in English and I only conducted tours in English. Got it. Okay. Um, what prompted you to take this year and a half, first to serve in the IDF, and then to stay another year and a half and study at Hebrew University and do this tour work? What prompted you to leave Princeton in the middle of your studies and go to Israel? Well, I always wanted to serve in the IDF. Uh, it was always a question of when. I was facing, facing a crisis of, of meaning. I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself at school. I didn't know where I wanted to go, what I wanted to study, what I wanted to do with my life. So I decided to do the most honorable thing I could think of doing, which was joining the IDF. That's lovely. And what Now, why join the IDF uh, specifically? I actually said this. Uh, I was asked this question almost daily by the uh, native Israelis yes. who were flummoxed that someone would come and volunteer for this uh, a duty because very often it's quite miserable. You don't sleep, you're always cold or you're hot. Uh, not fun. Yes. You consist mostly on cans of tuna and boiled eggs. Um, uh, but what I would say to them is that 2,000 years the Jewish people have been dreaming of this, to be able to fight for a Jewish army, protecting a Jewish nation, even using a Jewish-made weapon. And even pray for this moment and all I had to do in order to join such an enterprise is buy a flight ticket. It's like the opportunity of a lifetime. Amazing. And what about the character of your Jewish home growing up? First of all, are you an only child? Uh, sorry, you dropped out there? Do you have any brothers and sisters? I have a brother. He's in Rutgers. Um, He's uh, two years my younger. Okay. And what are your parents' names? Oh, so my dad's name is Victor. He immigrated to Israel from the Soviet Union. Ah. And my mom's name is Kineret. She was born in Israel, but her parents uh, lived in Iraq mm -hmm. until 1948. Mm -hmm. So your mother's a Sabra? Yes, she is. Mm -hmm. And did you grow up with a strong feeling from your parents about the state of Israel? Oh, absolutely. And my parents put their money where their mouth was. In what way? We didn't take, we didn't take many vacations. Uh, we didn't have the most impressive cars or anything because uh, almost all of our discretionary income went to pay for uh, 12 years of Jewish schooling, both for my brother and I. Mm -hmm. Now, we were never too religious. In fact, we were in a modern Orthodox school, and I think we were by far the least religious uh, kids there. But uh, it was very important for my parents to uh, understand Judaism, where our culture comes from, and the importance of the state of Israel. That is lovely. Um, did you enjoy your years? Which school, by the way? Which day school? Uh, so I went to Joseph Kushner Hebrew Academy yeah. through years one through eight. Uh, and then the high school was Ray Kushner Shiva High School. It's very the nice. same school, just different names. Did you, as you look back on that, were those years good for you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, Mainly for, aside from understanding where you come from, I'm personally not religious today, but I understand the Jewish laws. I understand how to read the Talmud. And uh, 
most importantly, I can go into a uh, Orthodox shul today and uh, not feel a stranger. Very nice. Understand what's going on. Okay, so now we come to the present. David, why yes. did you choose Princeton? Why did I choose Princeton? Well, it was uh, prestigious and it was close by. Uh, and that's essentially it. Fair enough. So here you are, you come back from three years in Israel, and you decide you're going to run for president of the student government, yes. which in and of itself sounds crazy, but I'm sure you had very good reason. And then this student, Brandon Flax, writes this hatchet piece about you, and I want to have a sense from you how did you feel? What was your reaction? What happened around you when any of your friends at Princeton may have read this piece by uh, Brandon? Well, I was not exactly surprised. I was surprised to see it published. Uh, but I did know some sentiment like that existed. Um, among my Jewish friends, the pro-Israel friends especially, they really galvanized around me. Uh, they were also shocked and appalled. Uh, which is why we had, uh, I believe, at least one piece written in my defense from Correct. another pro student. Yes. The uh, president of the CJL, the president and rabbi, Rabbi Julie Roth, did reach out to me, but uh, that's all I heard from the administrator. She's not exactly part of the administration, more tangentially related, uh, but that's about it. There wasn't much of an outcry or shock, mm -hmm. just among the small Jewish community. Did Brandon Flax interview you before writing his critique of you and the IDF? Oh, I've never personally met him. I didn't know he existed before <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. And did you serve in Gaza? Uh, I did serve for two days on the Gaza border. Exactly two days. Mm -hmm. uh, I do support the actions of the IDF along the Gaza border, but I was specifically stationed on the Egyptian border. In fact, in the first ever Israeli co-ed combat unit, my unit was 70% women, and uh, largely we protected Israeli border communities on the Egyptian border from ISIS attack. Very interesting. Where else did you serve during that year and a half? Oh, just there. Only you were on the Egyptian on the Gaza, Gaza border? border? Very interesting. What mm -hmm. was your experience, not in, you know, not in training, but now you're actually serving in the IDF. What was that like for you? Uh, it was definitely difficult. You don't really sleep. You're working very, very hard. It's, I'll put it, uh, your time isn't worth much money to the Israeli government. I usually a good comparison. I worked at Starbucks for three months this summer. And I was amazed at the labor-saving devices that were available to me mm -hmm. when I was washing dishes there. Mm -hmm. In Israel, my time wasn't worth at Starbucks. It was worth around 10 cents an hour. So one day a week was devoted to kitchen duty, constant str scrubbing, barely any soap, lots of hard work. But then the day what makes it really worthwhile is the people you serve with and the uh, people you protect. We were very well integrated into the border communities, and uh, they treated us with a lot of kindness, a lot of respect, as if we were their own children. Yes. By the way, you didn't go to serve in the IDF to make money. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> there are better ways to make money. Exactly. I was earning double what a typical Israeli earns because I have higher expenses since I'm not local there. Yeah. And it comes down to around $700 a month. Okay. Um, and what you just said seems to me the reason you're there. You're there because there was something about the experience that you hoped would touch you. And it sounds like that, in fact, did happen. And when you talk about the relationship you had with other members of the IDF, and when you talk about your relationship to the community, it sounds as if that was very special for you, David. Am I correct? Oh, that's absolutely right. Even if my experience was terrible, it would still be an honor to serve. All right. From your perspective, and, I, and quite honestly, I don't know whether you were there long enough, experienced enough, but I'll ask the question anyway. 
what, how would you describe the ethic of the IDF to another student at Princeton, or for that matter, to anybody who, who said to you, uh, you know, you, were, you hung around the IDF, you were in the IDF, what's the ethic, and are they really guilty of, let's say, hating Palestinians and abusing Palestinians? What always amazes me is that you can have two different people, of both of uh, good morals and good conscience, believing themselves both very well informed, and one person will tell you that Israel has the most moral army in the world, and the other person will tell you that the Israeli army is composed of a bunch of uh, hooligans and villains uh, who live to oppress Palestinian people. And the question is, how can these two very dichotomous thoughts exist in otherwise well-meaning and well-informed people at the same time? Uh, so I usually approach conversations from understanding that uh, the people I'm speaking with are not anti-Semitic, are not hostile necessarily to the state of Israel, but are misinformed. Uh, for example, uh, Brandon Flax's piece, no one is taking uh, chocolate away from Palestinian children, and the situation is much more complex than he uh, perceives it to be. When it comes to the ethic itself, uh, the, I can give you an example, actually, from my own service uh, in the border on the right next to the Sinai Desert, there was a very large Bedouin population who would constantly sneak into our bases to steal weapons. Now, the protocol for a trespasser, now, we don't know the person's intent as he's coming to the base. He could be armed, he could be not, it's dark, it's pitch black. You don't know what's going on. It went something like this. First you yell, stop, in Hebrew, and English, and Arabic. Uh, he doesn't yet stop, he keeps going. You sort of make a noise with your weapon, it's not loaded yet. And uh, he continues to advance. Then you shoot in the air, he continues to advance. And then only when he's very close to you, you perceive a weapon, and he refuses to stop, you can shoot him in the leg. That's the order of operation there. In the Which leg? Why you, in the leg? I, oh, excuse me, I misspoke. If you perceive a weapon, you can shoot him in the uh, shoot to kill. Okay. Okay. Uh, boy, did that ever happen to you? Uh, I have encountered trespassers. We all have encountered trespassers uh, in southern Israel, but nothing like that's ever escalated in that way. Okay, I'm hoping you never had to shoot at anybody. Did you have to shoot no, at no, someone? No, Okay, so you carried a weapon, you were taught how to use it, and in the end you don't use it, correct? Uh, correct. Okay, and if somebody said to you, you're, you're around young people your age, these are Israelis, they finished high school, now they have their responsibility is to serve in the IDF. Boys serve for three years, girls serve for two years. And so you're getting to know them. You said that that was part of the positive experience you had. If, as you experience them, do you think that the young people who are part of the IDF units you were in, do they hate Palestinians? Do they hate Palestinians? No, they live with Palestinians. As in they are their neighbors, they're their friends. They don't hate Palestinians, but they do hate terrorists and they hate the supporters of terrorists. Yes, yes. By the way, I'll that give is... you an example, actually. Please, go ahead. In my unit, a very special case. I won't reveal his name uh, because he'd be in danger, but we had a Palestinian Arab who served with us in the combat unit. And? Oh, it was uh, very special to see. Everyone treated him as one of their uh, own. He was uh, part of the pack, part of the brotherhood. There was no animosity at all. And here he was sharing the same uh, tent as everyone else, the same food as everyone else, fighting the same fight as everyone else. And he was trusted, wasn't he? Absolutely. So, David, where do you think it comes from? this general feeling, not only in the air,
but more specifically in the halls of academia. Not only in the halls of academia, David, but in the elite halls of academia. At Princeton, at Columbia, at Stanford. Where does it come from, this notion that Israelis hate Palestinians and that they are brutalizing Palestinians? And then, you know, you were very honest in this discussion so far. You haven't said you went, you went to Israel, you served a year and a half in the IDF, and it was just peachy keen, wonderful. You had the best time. It was like going to Disneyland. No, what you said was it was very hard. You appreciate it more in retrospect than you did when you were going through it because it was so hard and unpleasant. And yet when I ask you to talk about the people and the ethic, you describe something that you never hear in general conversation in America and certainly don't hear in the halls of academia on major college campuses. Why do you think it is, and you must have thought of this, where does it come from that in America, not only, you know, not only the branded flaxes, but many, as you said, good meaning, bright, intelligent, moral American Jews, not only youth, but adults, have such a warped idea of who the IDF is and how they act? I'll say that the, it's a very big question, and I think there's uh, two prongs to this answer. The first is in the halls of academia. Uh, it's, it is quite left-wing and uh, sometimes quite radical. Uh, there is uh, a phenomenon that, uh, that uh, is very against um, colonialism, imperialism, and justifiably so. And Israel is very much as a colonial and imperial project. So it's true that Israel was to an extent a settler colonial project. The difference was that there was no mother nation. The Jews came to stay because that is their ancestral homeland. But academics are academics. The question is, how did this disseminate to the general population, especially on the left? And I think a lot of that is the fault of the media. Mm -hmm. How things are reported aren't 100% uh, transparent. Imagine you take a budding journalist, you put him in Israel, and then uh, he or she has two weeks to figure out the lay of the land. Who are they surrounded by? Other journalists, often ideologues, and the fixers they have, fixers meaning the people who, the local people who pass along information, get them shots, are typically local Palestinians. Now, among local Palestinians, there isn't necessarily freedom of speech in the West Bank and especially in Gaza. So the information disseminates that way. Whether or not these journalists are ideologically pure or they have some sort of alternative, ulterior motive, uh, they receive information from their fixers, which may not uh, correspond with reality. In fact, often does not. And then that's uh, disseminated to the general public without a caveat. Mm -hmm. in a very neat narrative with a bow tie on top. Mm -hmm. All right. It's interesting to hear you analyze it. It doesn't, but wait. It's very much the question of our time. Meaning what? Especially among the Jewish. Uh, I see it up close and personal all the time. It's almost heartbreaking to see young Jews uh, virulently anti-Israel. Yes. Do you think that the students at Princeton understand that the BDS movement's ultimate goal is to undermine the legitimacy of the state of Israel and ultimately to see it disappear from the Middle East. Do students at Princeton understand that? I think some of them do. Some of them don't. Uh, in 2014, my first year at Princeton, we had a, a uh, BDS referendum uh, on campus uh, the idea or the premise of which was to urge uh, the university to divest from Israeli enterprises. And I believe it failed by some 80 votes. Which is not that many. It is not that many. Yes. We won by the skin of our teeth. Mm -hmm. David, is there anti-Semitism pure and simple at Princeton? Is there anti-Semitism? Uh, that's a tough question, especially when you 
when a lot of the anti-Israel detractors are also Jews, and a lot of the anti-Israel detractors enjoy the company of Jews, it's difficult to brand them anti-Semites. Though it definitely makes the claim that they are co-opted by anti-Semites. To what extent is uh, anti-Israel critiques anti-Semitism? Of course, on face value, it's not. But those who brand themselves anti-Zionists, I would say, are anti-Semites. Mm-hmm. In the sense that they would reject the right of self-determination to the Jewish people while giving it to all other nations. Yes. By the way, David, you lost, I understand. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, was Flax's piece in any way contributory? Uh, it's impossible to say. What do you feel? I believe I would have... I believe I would have lost otherwise. Okay. Because of the nature of the election, it was one establishment candidate versus one uh, somewhat anti establishment candidate. Uh, so it was always going to be an uphill battle. Not to mention, I didn't really have any friends on campus. Mm-hmm. Uh, having left for three years, they've all graduated. So every single vote we got was from personal door to door efforts, convincing people one on one. I understand. Do you think you want a career in politics, David? Do I want a career in politics? I don't believe I'm wise enough yet (laughs) for a career in politics, but I'm certainly open to it in the future. You are lovely and you're courageous. You were courageous, by the way, for the stands you took on behalf of the student body during your campaign. You were courageous to go and serve in the Israeli army for whether it was a year and a half or whatever. And you're courageous to take the stand you now do in public. And I am so, it's been a pleasure meeting you, albeit on the phone. I hope one day that I get to sit with you in person. And I wish you kol tuva hatzlacham. May you only have great success as you complete Princeton and in anything else you want to do in life. And I hope I stay in touch with you. Thank you very much, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Be well. David Esterlitt, who took three years off from his studies at Princeton to go to Israel, served for a year and a half in the IDF, only to find that once he returned to Princeton, his service in the IDF would be grotesquely portrayed in a lie worthy of the blood libel and the protocols of the elders of Zion. Again, we wish David only the best throughout the rest of his studies at Princeton and throughout his entire life. And it's another form of vicious anti-Semitism that is just emerging from under the rocks and requires all of us, Jew and non-Jew alike, all Americans of goodwill throughout our nation to stand up in vocal acts of protest. The lies may not stand, and the only way to destroy a lie is to drown it with the voice of truth. And that's what we'll try to do here on JBS. As always, my thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's Associate Director, Dara Golub, Technical Director, Michael Paley, Transmission Manager, John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.